<sighs> the comfort of your favorite seat is now your comfy car selling command center, thanks to Carvana. It doesn't get any better than this. Your favorite seat's the best spot in the house. Make it even better by entering your license plate or VIN and getting a real offer in minutes. There really is no place like home. And speaking of home, Carvana will pick up your car from yours after you finalize your offer. Visit Carvana.com or download the app and sell your car from your comfy place. Need to stock up on any weather wardrobe staples? Check out American Giant for hoodies, jackets, sweats, and more pieces you can wear anywhere. All made right here in the USA. Go to American-Giant.com and use code AnyStyle24 for 20% off your order. Following program are pre recorded. Talk of the town on Super Talk 1270. Super Talk 1270, you're tuned to Talk of the Town. I'm Steve Bakken, and it is time to check in with Tom Briggle, owner of the Bismarck Bobcats. Tom, thank you for a great season, not the way we wanted it to turn out against Minot. Yeah, absolutely. You know, it was a, it was a great season and reflecting back, but of course, we're all competitors, and, and, uh, you know, we wanted to win, and we thought we were built to win, and, so Minor was a good team. We know they're a good team and um, might have got an extra bounce or two. But at the end of the t- day in the, the five games, that uh, the four games, excuse me, that we played, you know, they won three of them and they ended up being uh, the better team and ended up on top. And so, um, yeah, we're disappointed. And, you know, the last day of the year is always the toughest day of the year because you just think about, you know, some of these guys have been here three, four years. They're Bismarckites, right? And uh, it's very sad, you know, a lot of hugs, a lot of tears, and a lot of I love yous. It's it's interesting. Uh, it's one of my least favorite days of the year, um, but it's also one of my most favorite days of the year. I tell my bus driver today, because he goes through, he gets all the hugs from the boys. I get, you know, hugs from the boys, and, you know, just a lot of love is shared. And so, um, and you walk out, and I told Brad, I said, I walked out, I went over to, I went over to our, our beer beer pourers uh, bar first call in and it smelled like a hockey player <laughs> everybody moved everybody moved to the corners <laughs> so it wasn't it wasn't pretty but no but more seriously you know i think the boys had a tremendous year and, and we're proud of them and they should be proud of themselves and the fans were awesome and they loved the boys and the effort there was we didn't lose due to lack of effort, that's for sure. Well, you mentioned Minot's a really good team, and, and I want to come back to our team here, but let's talk about Minot for a few minutes. Um, yeah, they are yeah. a really good team, and um, one of the things going forward in the playoffs, they got a shot to win the whole thing, don't they? They do, right? We think they do. You know, at this at this point now, for the fans that don't know, so we have four divisions in our league, and the top team that won the playoffs comes out of each division and uh, they get seeded one through four. And so one plays four and two plays three. And um, they're good teams. All of them are Lone Star, Maryland, Minot. They're all really good teams. And so it's going to come down to uh, uh, hard hard work and, and hard play and also, you know, some bounces. They play a best of three. They play a best of three against each other, and then a one-game winner takes all for the championship. And so the format's kind of interesting, and uh, I like it. You like the one game? and, we, and, and We think and, they have a chance. <clears throat> so when you're looking at uh, how things might shake out, uh, you know, it, it's never easy ending a season like this, but... Yeah. Is it easier to reclimate the season ending if you wound up losing to the eventual champions? Uh, sure. Yeah, we, it, it's kind of a mixed bag. We'd love them to win. But it's Minot, uh, for heaven's sake. Because they represent our division, then we'd love them to lose. <laughs> but it's Minot. So they don't, it doesn't give an asset to uh, recruit us, recruit against us. <laughs> so, <clears throat> we on balance, we want to win, but you know, we we do, but I, I'd be lying to you if I didn't say, okay, and it's one more hurdle to recruit against, right? Right. Uh, so yep. one thing, too, is, is the format this year is, could there be some changes with the format for next year? Because there's two teams that are joining our division 
for next year, aren't there? Oh, you mean in the yeah in the playoffs? So the playoffs won't change in our in our division. Uh, we'll have uh, l- un- not unlike the Midwest division they've had. I think they actually have nine, maybe, but um, four teams will make it to the playoffs. Four of the eight, and we'll play down just like we did and and always have. So it's not uh, it's not like we'll have a play in round or something like that. It'll just be that four out of the eight. So it's incumbent upon us and you know our staff to. We want to get to playoffs. We got to do a great job recruiting. It's going to be two teams harder. Well, tell us about those two teams. Who's joining the league for next year? Yeah, it's kind of interesting because one's been in the works for about mm, eighteen months, and and it's something as a town people in North Dakota and Bismarck be familiar with is Watertown, South Dakota, and you know they've been wanting to come in for a while, and um, their rink just got finished, and so they're going to. Uh, uh, come in this coming year. And so what that created is a little bit of a challenge in, in several ways because it's hard to have anyone that's doing scheduling. It's hard to have an odd number of teams because you'd be off. You'd be off every weekend, right? Someone would be off. And that makes it hard to schedule, um, because we don't own our arenas. And there'd been another team kind of, laying in the weeds that also wanted to join. And so we went after them uh, pretty hard. And um, they're going to be playing in Forest Lake, Minnesota. And so it's going to be two new teams. And the regular season will change a little bit. We used to play all the teams you will know and recall. We used to play them all. Six home, six away, 12 in total. Now it'll be four home, four away, uh, eight in total against any given opponent. And so it's a perfectly balanced schedule, which from a hockey standpoint, of course, is uh, is perfect because some of the teams used to play in other divisions, and it was hard to catch them because you couldn't go head-to-head. So, you know, it'll be good. It'll be exciting. It'll be fun for the fans to see some, some new logos and uh, new teams, and, you know, we're excited about it. So both of these teams are brand new from scratch teams. They're not teams stepping up to our league. These are brand new from scratch. They they are. And so they've hired coaches and they've hired uh, scouts. And in order to create a little bit of an equilibrium, they get an advantage. And I don't know maybe too much detail, but we get eight tenders a year. They get 15 their first year. And a tender, you recall, is a contract where that player will definitely play for them. Um, so they can go after any free agent and tender them to a, uh, an agreement to start off with a stronger nucleus. So there's, you know, an opportunity for parity for them. And, um, you know, that's really helpful. But yeah, they're already, I mean, they're hitting, hitting the pavement running and, uh, you know, they're picking up players and tendering players every day. Well, the good news is it's not like some leagues where they get to go draft out of the existing teams and take some of their players as well. So that's some good news also. Uh, when we come back from the break, I want to talk a little bit about, uh, you know, the kids moving on, the kids that are staying, uh, what's the core of next year look like? Uh, that we're talking with Tom Briggle, owner of the Bismarck Bobcats, uh, disappointing, a uh, heartbreaking loss to Minot in the playoffs. Not a disappointing season, though. Great season for the Bobcats and their fans. This is Talk of the Town on Super Talk 1270. You're home of the Bobcats. Super Talk. That's not just the sound of that first sip of Morning Joe. It's the sound of someone shopping for a car on Carvana from the comfort of home. That's a good blend. It's time to take it easy, like answering some easy questions to get pre-qualified for a car in minutes. Talk about starting the morning right. Just like customizing your terms so your car fits your budget. Mm, mm, mm. Visit Carvana.com or download the app to experience car shopping the way it should be. Convenient. Comfortable. Ah. Talk of the Town on Super Talk 1270. Super Talk 1270, you're tuned to Talk of the Town. I'm Steve Bakken along with Tom Briggle, owner of the Bismarck Bobcats. Uh, disappointing loss to Minot in the playoffs. Not a disappointing season right here on the home of the Bobcats, Super Talk 1270. Uh, great season for the fans. Uh, before we get into thanking them, I want to get into 
the team itself. Uh, so who are we losing? Who's moving on? Uh, what positions? What uh, core of players? Uh, there's always some losses. You get some kids that age out. You get some kids that commit to the next level. Where are we looking at right now? Uh, one thing is that we're going to lose. What we're going to lose and have to replace is uh, not addressing the positions immediately, but is our leadership group. Because as we've talked about all year long, Locker room. And we've had uh, three guys in particular that have been there three and four years. When you talk about Patrick and and Beacom and and Roloffs and just you know the whole leadership group that we've had uh, was a big part of our success. Now. Uh, so we're going to lose our leadership. We're going to lose a lot of our captains. Not all of them. Ian Ingle will be back. And, and you and I were just visiting off air. We had another captain come back, but he just committed today. And so we can talk about that in a bit, too. But So we're going to lose some leadership um, for sure. And, you know, the good news, too, is I think we placed, I think, 12 kids, maybe 13 now. Division One uh, is how many Division One players we have on our roster, which is pretty darn good. Kudos to Lane and Nico and Hunter. Uh, that's pretty dang good in our league to have 13 because, as we've always talked about, we start from scratch, and those kids and, and coaches have to earn every placement. So, uh, but we're gonna, you know, we're gonna lose a number of D1 kids um, for sure. And mostly in terms of position, we're gonna have to really work hard on replacing our defensemen. And we had uh, a really solid core. I think we had five veteran defensemen this year that are moving on. And so Nico's out there pounding the pavement. We've got some really nice players coming in. Um, you know, I'd love to talk to you about that. Maybe on another show, maybe we do a show around our trial camp if you're up for it. Absolutely. Um, would be, would be a good show to kind of talk about that. But on the other side of the coin, we have a lot returning too. I mean, we could return as many as uh, four of our top four scorers. It's possible. Uh, Evan Hunter will be back. Julian Bowman will be back. A lot of fan favorites. Tronin, we're not sure. Kohansky, Kohansky got drafted, so we might, he might move on. It's hard to know. So, you know, we could, though, literally have our top four scores back, which would be a great thing. And then on the back end, Matt Rafalski was a new Bobcat this year. You know, he's a, he's a really good player and, Fans will recognize him. His dad played in the NHL for a number of years, has a couple Stanley Cup rings, and he's a really smart player. So, you know, he'll be back, and we have a good nucleus of all fours uh, forwards uh, coming back as well, like, uh, you know, Konitz and uh, Friend and, you know, some, some good players. And so Alexander Kim that we talked about, right, from Kazakhstan will be back, and He's got a buddy that plays defense that could be back. Kopecki will be back. He's a D1 commit. Um, Armio. And then, I don't know if you remember this, but we had a boy that got hurt last year. His name is Nick Miller, and he's just a stud. And uh, he only played about eight games. And, man, he, he played well, but he blew out his knee. So he'll be back. And Dan Johnson on the back end. So we got a good nucleus coming back. Um, I guess we didn't touch on goalies. We're going to lose both our goalies, right? Um for, for, for great reasons. And so, um, gotta replace them goalies for sure. And, um, we've got a young Weigel who grew up in Bismarck, but played at Moorhead. You know, he'll, he's, uh, been tendered, so he'll be, uh, fighting for a spot. And then we just picked up a, a boy, tendered a boy last week. And he's a big boy, about 6'4, and I guess he's just a big kid. And he was a leading goaltender in the Manitoba Junior Hockey League with phenomenal stats and born and raised in Stillwater, Minnesota. And, uh, you know, so he'll be fighting for a spot. And we're probably going to bring in another one just to have a healthy competition to make sure, you know, it all starts on that. And we had phenomenal goaltending, as you know, this year. And so we got to replace that too. Um, but that's what we do. You know, the, the scouts and coaches, they, they find these boys, they develop those boys and they get them in college and, and you can't complain about any of that. You know, the indicator of the program doing well is, for me, when I look at the Bobcat roster and even around the league, it's the number of kids that are moving on to D1, the D1 commits, because that tells me that that level of hockey is on the right path. Yeah, without a doubt. I mean, our league, like, I think people are coming to understand how good our league is when you, when you watch the play and, and you look at the commits. I mean, we set a new record again this year. We set a record every year for D1 commits. I mean, Back in the day, you know, you heard me say this, but back in the day, our league, you know, maybe we had uh, 50 or 80 or 100 commits. I don't know, Division One 
now we're well over 200, 250, a few NHL players, including right this year, a couple of Bobcats. And um, it's just, uh, yeah, you want to move them on. I mean, that's our fundamental. Of course, we want to win. Want to win. Want to. We'd love to buy the boys a ring because it's fun, right? Um, but moving them on and developing them, you know, as uh, players, but as you know really well, also as like we're so proud of the young men, and we talk about it a lot this year. Like this, by our our group is always good, but this year was superior in terms of being the community and and like we've talked about working with senior citizens, like working in all kinds of situations that is a little ahead of their years, like you know, people with dementia at some of these homes, you know, they go up and play, you know, kick a little ball or, you know, things that keep seniors' minds, you know, active. So they get exposure to that. They got the little kids in the schools. I mean, junior hockey is, is special. Like it's special and uh, in so many ways. And, and it's just great to be a part of it. And, particularly in Bismarck, man, that area, because the people are just, they love their Bobcats. <laughs> so, well, the other side of that right coin, by. too, Tom, yeah. is, you know, when you start talking special, you got to talk to fans. I mean, Bismarck fans, uh, Bobcat fans are, they're in another league. They're, they're, I'll say they're the best fans in the league. They travel, yeah. they, they yeah. the rivalries, the place is rocking every night. Um, you know, you know, going back to the boys a little bit, you know, this is the formative years where I think you do guys, you guys do a great job of teaching them how to be professionals and how to move on to that next level and, and setting the stage for uh, their social growth as their professional growth uh accelerates as well and that foundation is priceless but a lot of that comes back to the billet homes the fans the relationship within the community i mean it's one big family it, it is without a doubt and our sponsors are you know of course it's you know we need our sponsors to pay for it but beyond that they're just loyal like these sponsors they just love the boys they they get attached to them um you know there's just so many of them and um they're just so loyal and and it does take so many you look at sanford power you talk about development as professionals you get sanford power right and our boys we we probably have and i'm not braggy about it we probably have the best junior program maybe in the country at any level we got sanford power for workouts we got great fans our arena is just crazy fun uh the billets are kind uh and generous and take good care of the boys like a lot of towns can't find billets we don't have that problem. I can tell you that we got a waiting list and, um, it's a special hockey community and, and you, you know, you look at it and then you look at the hockey community broadly and not just the hockey community, but young athletes and young kids, but, but the hockey community, you know, these kids, they all want to grow up and be bobcats and that's just a feel good for Lane and I in particular, probably, um, because these kids that do make it to the bobcats and not that many do it's, it's, it's such good hockey. But all these little kids want to be Bobcats, <laughs> and it's fun, man. It's it's fun to watch when they come to games and collect those check of pucks. And um, Bobcat hockey, like we're just we're proud of it, but it's special, and, and it's really all the players you allude to. You know, just to say thank you to really everyone. I'm sure we've forgotten some people, like radio station uh, people, like Steve Bakken, and um, we. Uh, we got it going. We got it going, and we're really excited about next year already. Well, looking forward to being the home of the Bismarck Bobcats again next season. It is always a fun time. And, uh, you know, even though it's the off season, there's a lot of things going on. So you can always follow, get your season tickets for next year, follow what's going on with the kids that are getting tendered, kids coming in, uh, what. Uh, that roster is going to look like BismarckBobcats.com You can follow it all right there Tom, uh, disappointing ending But not a disappointing season The season was absolutely no, phenomenal not, not at all. We're, we're very proud I'll tell you one thing in closing <laughs> If you want to go onto our Facebook page And find a, a loyal fan Look for John Shoon he, uh, he tattooed his whole arm You know, I'll give Larson Tattoo a plug But go to our Facebook page And look at the detail in his arm, and that kind of is a statement for the whole loyalty of our fans. It's unbelievable. So I'll leave it there. You know, we're going to be selling season tickets. Look for that. 
and uh, we're getting ready to go for sure. Another great season coming up next year with the Bismarck Bobcats right here on your home of the Bobcats. Tom, a great off season. We'll keep in touch over the course of the summer. This is Talk of the Town on Super Talk 1270. Bye. America, we are endowed by our creator with certain unalienable rights, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. At Grand Canyon University, we believe in equal opportunity, and the American dream starts with purpose. To serve others in ways that promote human flourishing and create a ripple effect of transformation for generations to come. Find your purpose at Grand Canyon University. Private. Christian. Affordable. Visit gcu.edu. Without apology, the regular Joe Show with Joe Giganti. Weekday evenings at 9 on Super Talk 1270 and the free Super Talk 1270 mobile app. Welcome back to Talk of the Town on Super Talk 1270. Super Talk 1270, you're tuned to Talk of the Town. I'm Steve Bakken. And, uh, okay, something that's going on right now, and it's been going on for a long time, but we've kind of socially and politically let the envelope get pushed. And I'm not a fan of some of the directions that's gotten pushed. But recently, if you haven't heard, there was an attack ad. And, and things started out of the gate. And, and I, I'll even say Kelly Armstrong, Representative Kelly Armstrong, threw the first punch. Um, and the Tammy Miller Lieutenant Governor campaign, uh, they're fighting for the governor's office. Um, she's come back. And, and there's some things that I deem that you probably don't cross that line. And that's what happened with the Miller campaign. I deem that they crossed the line. And there's a lot of different people out there that are saying the same thing, uh, different media sources. Um, we're going to get into a little bit of who's not speaking up. And I think that's telling as well. But uh, Lieutenant Governor Tammy Miller ran an attack ad in which uh, pointed out that and this is the language of the ad from the Miller campaign. And I, I say there's falsehoods in a lot of politics. And uh, what happened was um, Kelly Armstrong, who was an attorney, uh, had represented a client before. And we're going to get into that in just a few minutes. And uh, in the attack ad, the Miller campaign says that Kelly Armstrong had benefited from victims in a sexual assault case. And we're going to get into that right now because we're going to talk, and, and that to me is crossing a line. That That is somewhere you do not go, especially in North Dakota. A lot of people are familiar with the case. It happened in a smaller town uh, in Dickinson, North Dakota, and people are familiar with that. Um, so one of the victims, uh, Mariah, is joining us on the program right now. Mariah, uh, thanks for coming on this morning. Yeah, thanks for having me, Steve. I appreciate it. So, I, I okay, uh, political attack ads have gotten really, really out of hand, and it's gotten to the point that what do you believe anymore? So, um, not to dig into the weeds too much, but if you wouldn't mind, just kind of give a little overview of what took place with the case and, and how it pertained to uh, Representative Armstrong as an attorney, a defense attorney at the time, and then I want to get into why this is wrong um, from a political standpoint. But, but just a little background for our listeners so they know where we're coming from. Okay, so 17 years ago, my sister and myself came forward as abuse victims um, by an individual. Um, we went forward, we pressed charges. Um, he retained an attorney, um, which was Kelly Armstrong. Um, Kelly's a really good I'm, I'm sure he's still a really good attorney, even though he's gone the politics route, but he was a really good attorney, and he was the person that you went to when you really needed help. Um, Kelly did his job. The criminal justice system is designed in favor of criminals, and it's not there to help individuals that are harmed by those criminals. Um, we managed to... Um, essentially, the, the person filed... Um, pleaded an offered plea of guilt, which basically meant that there is enough evidence to prove him guilty, but he didn't want to be found guilty. Um, and then he, Matt, I don't remember how long he had for um, probation, but then he had 15 years on the registry. And actually that just 
expired. He's no longer considered a registered sex offender. Okay, and the other part about this that's really tragic, it was uh, a family connection here as well. No, it was a family member. Okay, so um, just to put this in context uh, of where this is, so beyond the tragedy, now you've got that added layer of tragedy because it's uh, familial. And, you know, we've talked with the 31A Project, and, you know, if you're looking at uh, what goes on in the state of North Dakota, familial uh, issues are a bigger deal than most people understand. And most people, it's one of those things that, you really need to drag out of the closet and see the light of the day or you're not going to get better with it. So fast forward, you and your sister and your mother and your family have had some time to heal. I mean, it's trauma that's going to be there forever, but you've gone through the healing process, correct? Correct. So now we're coming to the political campaign season and representative armstrong former attorney well still attorney but um in dickinson practicing lawyer in dickinson uh is running for governor now and his opponent lieutenant governor tammy miller is running for governor now and it's gotten heated from the beginning and they have gone back and forth and i'll even say kelly threw the first blow on the attack ads um but the latest ad coming out from the Miller campaign pointed out this case. And, and in the ad said that Kelly Armstrong profited off of victims. Um, first of all, I've got a big problem in throwing something out like that because at the time, this was a very, very prominent case that took place in a small town, Dickinson, North Dakota, Everybody in the town and the community familiar with the case. And now this is all drudged up again for a political ad. So what are you guys dealing with as a family um, currently because of this political ad that is dragging in a third party innocent bystander and their family from this? You know, initially my... We were all speechless. My mom's been in tears since she first found out this was going to air. Um, I didn't know what to do. I didn't know what direction I was going to take with it other than I knew that this is not okay. Like her doing this was not okay. Um, so as a family, we just had to take a moment, take it in, like let all of our anger and rage settle down before we decided to stand up against it. My sister and I discussed that because of the location of the trial, because of who our family is, um, we're no strangers to our community, we're a large family and we're all pretty outspoken, that it wasn't going to be difficult for them to figure out who we were. So we came forward, we announced our names, we said this happened to us, this is not okay. We asked the Miller campaign through um, a press article for them to remove the ad, and they stood by the decision of running the ad, and they stated that all we did was validate the truth behind the ad, and they continued running. So how did you first find out that this ad was going to be aired, that this ad was coming forward? Um, I, I think so. I'm pretty sure, like, I don't know if Kelly got a heads up about it or if he read through the oppositional research packet that has to get sent out to show proof for these types of ads. Um, but he found out what was going to happen. So he called my dad to give him a heads up just so that we weren't blindsided by it so that my dad could make all of us aware of what Tammy Miller's campaign was going to do. So Representative Armstrong is actually the one that had to break that news to your family, which as an attorney, I'm sure that he was just in dumbfounded by this that and blindsided um, and then having to go and and share that information with your family. Because, again, Dickinson, a very small, very tight knit community. um, You guys are all friends. We are. Actually, um, Kelly, when he's in town, he comes and drinks at the bar. Um, my family was at the bar in Dickinson. Um, I reached out I reached out to him during COVID with some stuff that was going on um, that somebody else needed to listen to. Like, we're no strangers to each other, and we do call each other friends. We're talking with Mariah Marsh uh, concerning political attack ads. Tammy Miller campaign came out with an attack ad uh, that, uh, as a victim, 
really crossed the line when it comes to victims' rights and identifying a victim in a legal case. Uh, we're going to talk more about that when we come back from the break. I'm Steve Bach, and this is Talk of the Town on Super Talk 1270. Super Talk. Man, that sunset is gorgeous. Grill, patio, sunset. Hard to get better than that. Unless you're browsing Carvana's inventory while you soak it all in. Oh, burger time. So sit back, get comfortable. Carvana's got thousands of cars under $20,000 just waiting for you. I could stay here forever. Carvana, where car buying meets comfort meets convenience. Download the app or visit Carvana.com today. Talk of the Town on Super Talk 1270. Super Talk 1270, you're tuned to Talk of the Town. I'm Steve Bach, and we're talking with Mariah Marsh, um, a victim of a sexual assault for, along with her sister and unfortunately uh, a case that was a long time ago but it's popped up in a political ad a political attack ad by Lieutenant Governor Tammy Miller and it's crossed the line I mean to the point where a victim has come forward going wait a minute this is wrong uh, Mariah this is wrong I mean it, it, have we gotten so far down the road in the weeds with political ads and what's true, what's not true, and you can say anything without consequences? It, it's wrong, it, especially in a state like North Dakota where we hold our neighbors in high regard, where we consider ourselves a pretty small community. It's, you know, a couple degrees of separation and, and we're all neighbors here in North Dakota. Uh, this, it, to me, is absolutely abhorrent that a political – somebody looking for political gain would throw a victim of a heinous crime under the bus like this. Yeah, I mean, you said it pretty well, right, just like that. There's so many different ways to describe how wrong it is that it doesn't even have to be discussed. Okay, so when you reached out to the Miller campaign and asked that the ad not air or be pulled, and once again, what was the response from, because it was Dawson Schefter, I believe, that was, is the campaign manager for Tammy Miller, uh, Lieutenant Governor Tammy Miller. Uh, he was also very involved with the governor and the governor's campaigns. Um, what was the response? Was there any remorse? Was there any sympathy? Uh, what happened in that conversation? Yeah, so just to be clear, we did not directly reach out to the Miller campaign. And to be honest with you, we never even thought of that. I never even knew that that was an option to, to reach out to them first and then go to the media using the newspaper. So I learned what their response was when I read the newspaper article that was published um, that my with my sister and I standing up against what she and her campaign chose to do. Has the Miller campaign reached out to you guys directly to go, hey, we apologize, it, you know, we may have made a mistake, there is an error? Because in the article, they were standing by that ad. They, they were not going to retract that ad. Have they made any overtures whatsoever of remorse for the victims of a heinous crime like this? Um, to this point, they have not reached out to us. I'm not sure if they plan to. I feel like they made their statement. They're standing their ground. They will not admit that they made a mistake. And that is probably the biggest error in this whole thing. Okay. Do something, make a mistake, own up to it, apologize, change it. Yeah, that's what we do in North Dakota. At least that's what we're supposed to do. So, I, you know, for me, I got a couple, and, and I'll leave you out of the pol political side of this, but for me, I've got a couple issues. One, uh, somebody that the governor would have as their lieutenant governor that doesn't have this remorse, I've got some serious concerns about their character issues. And also, this is a reflection for me personally back on the governor and their character issues as well, having a campaign and a lieutenant governor that is in this light. Now, if you want to make the extrapolation and connect the dots directly, feel free to do so because I'm kind of going there. But this is so wrong on so many levels. Um, Mariah, you've talked to some attorneys and, um, and I'm guessing it's probably a statute of limitations or it was not in case or not enforced beforehand. Um, 
that, you know, we have Marcy's Law in North Dakota supposed to protect victims of crimes. And, and I'm guessing that doesn't apply here because this took place before Marcy's Law was enacted, correct? So I am not an attorney. I, I have, I'm pretty smart, but I've never taken that type of education. I'm a nurse. So if you ask me something medical, I can answer the question. But in relation to legal questions, I am novice at it. And all I know is, is that I was, um, it was explained to me that the past, that there's a chance because the crime happened prior to Marcy Law existing, um, it, it doesn't hold water to, to today's situation. You know, one of the things that's going through my head right now is in North Dakota, we have an ethics commission. And as that would pertain to Representative Armstrong in any case, I, I don't think so because he's at a federal level. That would be a different ethics commission that he would answer to if um, if he did something incorrect. However, a sitting lieutenant governor in the state of North Dakota I would think would fall under an ethics violation in this case because from a morality perspective, this is way over a line. This has crossed a line and politics should not go this far. And I, I, I'm, I, I'm wondering if there's an ethics issue here. I, I know there personally for me, there's a character issue. I, I've got some serious character concerns about a candidate that wants to represent North Dakotans while throwing North Dakotans under the bus. I, I've got a serious problem there. Um, do you believe there should be an, uh, some sort of a recourse when it comes to ethics in state politics? Because this is state politics. And why do we have an ethics commission if there's not some accountability? I agree with that 100%. Um, I feel like a person in that type of position needs to be ethically sound and make good moral decisions for the residents that she's representing. She is currently the lieutenant governor. She is under Governor Burgum. She holds this position. She should not be coming after the residents of North Dakota or anybody else just to get herself ahead in this political campaign. You know, I find it rather ironic that in the ad, um, they threw Representative Armstrong under the bus for political gain using a victim of a crime. Isn't that what's going on with Lieutenant Governor Tammy Miller's ad? is they're throwing a victim of a crime under a bus for political gain? Isn't that exactly what's going on right now? That's exactly what it is. She is trying to profit off of us, off of our negative experience and the abuse that we suffered to get herself ahead. All right, so in the newspaper article, they said they're not withdrawing the ad. They're not, I mean, I, I had no sense of any remorsefulness or anything um, that was apologetic coming out of that. Uh, as far as you and your family right now, what would you like to have happen? What would you like to see? I, I, I know there's no way to make this whole at this point, but what would be your preferred outcome as a family? Um, so I actually uh, did a Facebook video that I put out this morning. I want her, I want Tammy Miller to apologize to the residents of North Dakota and to anybody that has had to do the ad. And I'm going to add to that, I want her to additionally apologize to any victim of any, or excuse me, I really don't like the word victim, but anybody that has endured an assault of any kind because it triggered emotions for them also. All of these people deserve an apology. For me, for my family, I don't think that an apology at this point would carry any weight, but I think she needs to do something to acknowledge how wrong this situation is. Especially coming from somebody who wants to represent North Dakotans. I, I, I still, there are so many ethics and character issues. Uh, it just, it, it's wrong and it's detestable to me. Um, is, as far as that video, is uh, is that shareable? Do you have an open Facebook page? And I don't want to invite any craziness to your world that you're dealing with beyond this, but is it beyond this? Um, that's a great question. Um, it, it, how do you, you get that video out for people to see it? Um, so I just want to be really clear about this. I am standing up strong with my family. I have nobody pushing me to make these decisions, to do these interviews, to take this strong stand against Tammy Miller and what her campaign has chosen to do. 
Um, I did post that video this morning. I've also posted a couple other things because May is Mental Health Awareness Month. I am a nurse. I do see how much mental health plays into the behavioral health of people, and obviously that's an issue in North Dakota or all over the country right now. Um, so I want to be clear that nobody is pushing me to make any of these decisions and to do what I've been doing. But I do have a Facebook page. I am Mariah Mersh. And the videos that I'm posting um, and anything related to this case I've been making public so that people can share it, so that they can stand up with me and stand against it, so that a, vic- uh, a person that endures this type of abuse or any type of abuse can never be taken advantage of again for political gain. Amen. Um, Mariah, thank you very much for coming on and telling your story. Uh, you know, when politics get dirty, that's one thing. When politics cross a line, that's entirely something else. And uh, I, I cannot send enough prayers out for you and your family. I appreciate it, and I appreciate you taking the time to visit with me. Thank you, Mariah Marsh. Uh, political attack ads uh, gone way, way wrong uh, and crossed the line. This is Talk of the Town on Super Talk 1270. LXX Mandan Bismarck, a Town Square media station, broadcasting from the View Community Credit Union Studio. With everything you have on your plate, earning your degree online seems impossible. But at Grand Canyon University, we specialize in helping you fit a master's degree in education into your busy day. Your graduation team, led by your own GCU counselor, provides you with the personal support you need to succeed. Achieve your goals with a plan and team behind you. Find your purpose at Grand Canyon University. Visit gcu.edu. Love out the pets. Steve Dale's Pet World. Saturday afternoon at 4 on Super Talk 1270. Portions of the following program are pre recorded. Welcome back to Talk of the Town on Super Talk 1270. Super Talk 1270, you're tuned to Talk of the Town. I'm Steve Bakken. Fun event coming up. Uh, it's that time of the year again, Family Safety Day 2024. And uh, we've got Chad from Aero Service Team joining us. And, and you guys are such a big part of this. This is unbelievable. Yeah, thanks, Steve. Thanks for having me. Yeah, we're, we're really excited about the Family Safety Day and everything that goes into it and the, and the cause it's supporting. Okay, so... You talk about the causes, and, and let's give a little background. Uh, how many years have you guys been doing this now? Well, I've been in the emergency restoration business for a long time since I was born, but my parents have been doing it for 45 years. And in that time, we've seen a lot of first responders do a lot of awesome people for people, for others. And um, so we decided uh, four years ago is the answer that we were going to try and support uh, the crisis care chaplaincy who supports the first responders with mental health assistance. I remember when you did the first one, and, and people don't think about that all the time. It's like the, the people that run into danger to help those in need, um, who's there for them? And in a lot of cases, it's the crisis care chaplaincy. Or in cases where, you know, something bad happens, a car accident, or, or you got to tell a family member, um, it fell on law enforcement to, to go say, hey, um, I've got some tragic news. Uh, that's where the crisis care chaplaincy steps in in the community, and they're the ones that go and support those officers or those first responders when they're having to bear bad news or they've gone through a traumatic situation. Um, you know, there's some horrific things out there that first responders see that the rest of us don't. Um, unless you've been in those shoes, you don't always see what goes on or the mechanics behind a tragic situation. And that's where the crisis care chaplaincy steps in to support those that are the ones that run to danger. So the ability for you guys to be in, in, in such support of the chaplaincy and by default, the first responders and those on the front lines, you know, Chad, this is such a great event. Well, thanks. And I just really want to stress that these first responders, um, a a lot of very, very common that they see more trauma within a day, a week, a month than the average person sees in an entire lifetime. Very true. And then that's where this event comes in. So you've been doing this for, uh, this is the fourth year now. I remember yep. when you started the first one. Uh, for those that may not know, 
What exactly is Family Safety Day? Well, it's an event that is open to the public from 4 to 8 o'clock on May 17th. And basically what we do there is we have fun events, uh, fun activities, I should say, like carnival games, like pop a balloon, um, golf, uh, inflatables, uh, live music, some food. And then we have some some areas where we're t- doing some education, um, you know, with uh, the fire department. We have uh, someone doing boat boat and life jacket safety. Um, there's um, information on if, like, younger children, you know, they find a gun or something in someone's house and the parents aren't home, how to handle that situation. Uh, do, do you handle it or do you stop, get away, and tell an adult, you know? Um, we're not teaching any gun handling stuff or anything like that, but we're teaching the safety about how to handle a situation when you're in a situation with a bunch of other kids. Uh, we're going over bike riding safety. Um, there's a lot of different versions of bike riding, so we're going to hopefully educate the parents so they can make a decision on what the best route is for them because if you read the rules of the road and you have a first grader, I'm not sure it's your best foot forward to follow every rule of the road with them riding in traffic and things like that on busy streets. You know, the education piece is so important because, you know, this is a family night. It, it's this for the entire family, but the focus is on safety and safety education, uh, along with that carnival fun stuff, you know, you know, but when kids can learn and have fun doing it, things tend to stick a little bit better. So, uh, whether it's the boat safety, the fire safety, the bike safety, gun safety in that space, just get away, you know, getting those kids to learn that in a fun setting, those lessons tend to stick a little bit better. Um, you know, this is really an all ages event. I mean, there's no kiddos that are too young or, well, I'll call myself a kiddo too or too old to, to attend this. Um, cause it's just a great family event. Yeah. And we, it's a, it's a two day event for our private group. And we actually bring a lot of third graders from the area through the event, probably about a thousand, a thousand third graders. So at that point, it's set up very specific for, for a perfect, you know, for one age. But at our public event that we're speaking about four to eight on May 17th, it's set up from anyone from maybe two years old all the way up to an adult because um, there's probably no adult that can't pick up a tip from these safety lessons just because maybe they're safe, but maybe they're not thinking about something they can help their kids learn. Well, and that's the other piece, too, is as adults or parents, you can learn how to teach your kids at an event like this. And that's the other side of that is, um, you know, maybe you need a little refresher course, um, you know, Hey, you hop on the pontoon and do you really think all the time? Cause you're in this big pontoon. Do you think all the time about making sure that, that life jacket's on or some of the boat safety or, you know, we all get in a hurry and safety tends to kind of get pushed to the side sometimes because you're not thinking about safety. Safety is something that always needs to be in the forefront. So having an opportunity like this that refreshes people's memory uh, and goes, yeah, okay, we need to think safety first, always a great event. Um, how do people uh, track you down? Uh, I know you're on Facebook and other social media. Um, where's this located at? It's located at our uh, location in Bismarck, which is 2925 East Broadway Avenue. It's actually one building away from an ambulance depot, so that's kind of cool. And um, so basically we're over by the big boy in East Bismarck. And, uh, yeah, we're going to be there from 4 to 8 on May 17th. And there will be lots of stuff to do, lots to look at. And, um, yeah, that's basically the the rundown of where it's at and what's going to happen, rain or shine. The weather's looking favorable right now, so hopefully everything goes as planned. Okay, so this is a free family friendly event, uh, but you're also trying to raise some funds for the crisis care chaplaincy. How are you doing that? Well, we have a very robust silent auction that we have where we have had so many people uh, give items, just wonderful items to the cause. And we're going to get those all on our Facebook page. They're going to be dropping in every day uh, more. And, um, the other thing is, is we'll have some banners up with some donors, and we've had some tremendous donors that have gave lots of money to help make this happen because on the back end, the closed events, they're helping to provide busing, all kinds of different things that are needed to get all of these people to um, look after all these kids and teach them all these 
specific uh, different courses. And, of course, uh, free will donations. You know, we've got such a generous community. We're so blessed. You talk about some of the sponsors and some of the folks that uh, donate for the cause, for the silent auction. But, uh, you know, there's a lot of people that's like, hey, where's the bucket? I want to help out. So uh, we are so blessed to be in such a giving, caring community. Uh, Chad, thanks for putting this on. You're number four uh, for Family Safety Day. Yeah, we're really excited. Please, if you hear this, uh, come on down, and, you know, we'd love to have you. Uh, once again, uh, what time and what's the location? It's on May 17th from 4 p.m. to 8 p.m. Live music over on Broadway Avenue, 2925 East Broadway, just east of 26th Street. Thank you, Chad, from Arrow Service Team, uh, 2925 East Broadway Avenue in Bismarck. Uh, be sure to check it out on social media, uh, Facebook, uh, Family Safety Day 2024. It is for a great cause, helping out the crisis care chaplaincy in the community. This is Talk of the Town on Super Talk 1270. People. Super Talk. With everything you have on your plate, earning your degree online seems impossible. But at Grand Canyon University, we specialize in helping you fit a master's degree in education into your busy day. Your graduation team, led by your own GCU counselor, provides you with the personal support you need to succeed. Achieve your goals with a plan and team behind you. Find your purpose at Grand Canyon University. Visit gcu.edu. Talk of the Town on Super Talk 1270. Super Talk 1270, you're tuned to Talk of the Town. I'm Steve Bakken, and uh, an interesting program. Uh, Gate City Bank has been kind of the impetus behind this uh, as they have uh, kind of upped the investment to $23 million for home improvement programs across North Dakota and central Minnesota, for that matter. Um, Destiny Voth, uh, retail manager for Gate City Bank, uh, here in the studio with us. And Destiny, uh, welcome, first of all. And um, walk us through this program and what this means for consumers, because uh, I talk to builders, I talk to remodelers, I talk to people in the trades, and a lot of things have really slowed down. We're in the spring. I mean, we should be going gangbusters on home building, and we're not. And, and hopefully this program is we explain it to people can be another option for getting into home ownership. Yeah, that's the goal. These are special programs that Gate City Bank does in partnership with the cities of both Bismarck and Mandan. Um, so this is the inaugural year for the Bismarck program, but it's the second year for Mandan. So these initiatives are designed to revitalize mature properties, helping local homeowners make those repairs and improvements with a low interest rate. So... Let's take a step back because Mandan rolled this out first. So walk us through the process of getting it up and running in Mandan and then what you've seen from some of the metrics and how the response in the community have been. So really, we're just working with those cities initially to get it kind of kicked off. They have to be on board as well. So once we get involved with the cities, it's just that partnership of they are actually the ones who field the first initial contact and take those questions. And then it comes to Gate City Bank where we can talk about some of the specifics with amount, interest rate, et cetera. What does that look like programmatically when you're, okay, I've, I've got a property, I need a little work on it, I maybe need some help trying to get there. What's the process look like? Do you go to the city? Do you go to Gate City? Where do you go to go, hey, are there some different programs out there that are going to give me some lower interest rates to help with what I'm trying to accomplish in my home. So for this program, our neighborhood revitalization initiative, they would start at the city. Um, so the contact for Bismarck is, um, you can call just the city of Bismarck at 701-355-1854. And then Mandan, likewise, they can start just by calling the city of Mandan, 701-667-3225. And from there, it we do deal with a variety of projects. Some examples of qualifying projects for these programs range from patio additions, new garages, safety repairs that would include things like furnace replacements, accessibility adjustments, things that you'll find in some of those older homes that really need to be improved to make a difference for them. Things where you need updates, so whether it needs new windows, new roof, uh, some foundational issues, mm -hmm. um, a lot of safety. Uh, for a lot of people out there, ADA compliant, you know, being able exactly, to... Yep. Um, 
you know, increase the size of a hallway or a bathroom if you uh, have some ADA concerns. Th- there's a lot of different uses for this program. There definitely are, and these are things that come up a lot in those older homes. And people love their homes. They want to stay in their home, but maybe it's not the safest for them right now. So this program can help them make their home what it needs to be for them to stay there in a home that they already love. So when you're looking at uh, building a program like this, uh, what are the conversations that you had with the city of Mandan and now the city of Bismarck as the program is rolled out in Bismarck as well? So this is just something that we went to them and we said, hey, this is what we want to do. What are your thoughts on this? Honestly, it takes a lot of back and forth to get something like this kicked off. But we're very passionate about giving back to our communities and making a difference where we can. So we wanted to work hard to get this rolled out to our communities so we can take those funds and help these people in these situations. So we're excited to say we've allotted $2 million for each Bismarck and Mandan. So that's $4 million total that we've allotted within our community here. So is there a match or is it just a reduced interest rate? How does the program work? It is a reduced interest rate. Um, the rates are, we're offering for this are as low as 4.99% APR, which, like you said earlier, that's nothing close to what we're seeing right now. So it is a very substantial discount for them. Um, we have 10 or 15-year options available for the program. And additionally, um, we have some e- assessed values of the homes that we look at. So Bismarck, the homes must be 30 years or older and have an assessed value of less than $250,000. For Mandan, the homes must be 40 years or older with an assessed value of less than $275,000. So that helps us really speak to that specific group that we're trying to help. We're talking with Destiny Voth, uh, retail manager at Gate City Bank, uh, with a great program they've got uh, helping out Minnesota and, and North Dakota residents uh, across central Minnesota and kind of the footprint of of Gate City Bank and all of North Dakota. Um, what are some of the thresholds as far as project scope? So say I've got a, a $20,000 remodel to my home or I've got a $100,000 remodel. What is the scope of projects? I think because each project is going to be so different and so specialized, we really just ask that they reach out, make that initial contact and set up that connection with that lender. Um, That loan officer can really go through what are you wanting? What dollar amount are you needing? Um, We can look at other things aside from what I mentioned earlier. So things like um, some code and structural corrections, things like that that come up, um, emergency improvements, general property upgrades. So that could be, again, an emergency. Something happens that was unexpected. They don't have the funds for that. We just encourage them to reach out, get that conversation started with us. We'll take a look at the scope of the work and we'll be able to try to figure something out. Um, They do have to... Uh, credit qualify and have that home evaluation, but we're just working hard to hear what they need and what can we do for them, offering them that that lower rate. So other than calling the city of Bismarck or the city of Mandan for these programs, Mm -hmm. uh, if somebody wants more information, how do they contact Gate City Bank? Well, they can really just to keep it simple, call any branch. We'll get them to their contacts, but we have a designated personal loan officer here in Mandan, and then we also have a designated loan officer in Bismarck that are going to be kind of our go-tos for that. Any branch, though, is going to be able to direct them to those people, um, and they'll be able to really get that conversation kicked off and maybe start an application and see what we can do. And then just ask for the uh, home improvement programs. Yep, yeah. Great option out there, and uh, thank you for Gate City for really spearheading this and and getting it into the Bismarck and the Mandan communities uh, with <laughs> the interest rates right now. Uh, you're seeing uh, a lot of people trying to stay in their homes and a great avenue to be able to do just that. So uh, Destiny Voth, Retail Manager at Gate City Bank, thanks for coming in this morning. Thanks for having me. Uh, this is Talk of the Town on Super Talk 1270. 
Grand Canyon University's RN to BSN online degree program makes earning your bachelor's in nursing possible. Balance online coursework with local in-person clinicals to position yourself for potential leadership opportunities in the time you have from wherever you are, leaving room for what matters. Achieve your goals with your personalized plan and team behind you. Find your purpose at Grand Canyon University. Visit gcu.edu. Back to Talk of the Town on Super Talk 1270. Super Talk 1270, you're tuned to Talk of the Town. I'm Steve Bakken, and we are in political season. Of course, primary is coming up right around the corner, and uh, I do throw this out there. Uh, any candidate that wants to come on the program, this is an open forum. We've had some District 8 folks on. We've had some other uh, people that are running for office. Uh, anytime you want to come on, get a hold of me. Um, Steve.Bakken, townsquaremedia.com. Uh, my number's out there. Give me a call as well. Love to have all the candidates to make their case for why they want the position that they're running for. Uh, one of the candidates joining us right now, Dr. Rick Becker, he is a candidate for the U.S. House, a seat currently held by Representative Kelly Armstrong, who is not rerunning because he's running for the governorship of North Dakota. He's in the gubernatorial race. But, uh, uh, Dr. Becker, thanks for coming in this morning. You bet, Steve. Happy to be on. I uh, want to talk about uh, basically a lot of your platform and uh, why you're running for this position and where you're at on a lot of topics. But uh, one of the things I want to talk about first was there was a debate last uh, last weekend uh, because there's actually multiple candidates. So it's yourself, um, Julie Fedorchek, uh, who was not at that debate last week, uh, Kara Mund. Uh, who is running as a Republican, which is interesting to me because her track record and where her stance is on abortion doesn't speak yeah, a whole lot about being an, a Republican. She has an interesting platform for a Republican primary. It, yes. it is. And then uh, Alex Balaz, uh, who is the Republican endorsed candidate from the convention, because, and I want to get into that as well on why the dynamics, mm-hmm. why you couldn't be there. And then uh, there's a Charlotte Moore, who I'm not familiar with it. She's from uh, the Williston, Williston yeah. So that's the slate of candidates at the primary. Um, let's go back and talk a little bit about why you were not eligible to be the endorsed candidate at the Republican convention. Yes. So in uh, 2021, the uh, so we had the a chair of the state party, Perry Schaefer, and uh, the, there was a new law passed, and and they took advantage of that, and they they jammed uh, the the state committee with people that were more establishment and so they they got a bunch of rules passed the that old were guard. Fence, yeah they got a bunch of rules passed that were fence building to protect establishment and I'm sorry incumbents uh and so those rules included for instance uh big fees if you wanted to if you wanted to go to the convention and seek the endorsement you'd have to pay for instance $5000 if you're running for senator governor 3500 if you want to run for house they put those things in place. They increase the number of signatures you need to be able to get into the convention. You know, and I say that's that goes against everything that a lot of legislators tout is, oh, we're a citizen legislature. Well, yeah, shouldn't we be a citizen office holding state? Yep. I mean, plain and simple. Like, and I've got a big problem with the convention and the Republican Party, and I have for a long time, and the fact that dying on the sword of a incumbent for the sake of them being an incumbent. That's not what the convention should be about. You should have to prove it every time. Right. Once that, you have a track record, especially, you should have to prove it. The, the convention is for the people of North Dakota that are, that are Republicans, active Republicans, for them to take a look at all candidates, vet, vet them the candidates, yeah, exactly, and then and pick then the endorse best them. One. Yes. And so they don't need a select group of state party officials trying to narrow the field for them. They can do that at the convention. So then the, uh, another rule they put in place is if you ever ran uh, as an independent or another party, then you can't be at the convention for six years. And so that's the one that that got me. Well, it was the independent side. But it, right. And, and I've got a problem with that because if you're running as an independent, you're not running as anything. So you're not a Democrat. You're not no. a Republican. You're not a libertarian. You're not a pick a party. You're not running as anything. You're just another Correct. candidate. Yeah. What's funny is I, I was, I was at the time that I was running as an independent against John Hoven because of his reckless spending. Um, I was a Republican state legislator. So I was still a Republican. I never left and the Republican most would Party. And was extremely conservative. Oh, yeah, very. Uh, but what there's a state law. You can't run in a general if you didn't 
win the primary, you can't run for any party. You just ha- there's only one box you can check. It says independent. Correct. So anyway, so they they put these fence building rules in place, and um, so then at the convention, uh, I was there as a delegate. And so the two options that, that the delegates at the convention had to choose from were Julie Fedorchek, the establishment candidate, and then Alex Balaz, who's a newcomer. Nobody really knows him. Um, and so he was endorsed. There was a, there's a whole lot more to it. It's very interesting. Um, effectively, and, and this isn't a diss on, on Alex, but really the vote was that it was against Julie. Uh, the establishment did not fare well at the convention. So a rock running against Julie would have won. And to go to that point, you know, the, the, at the convention, they choose national delegates to go to the, the, the national convention. And typically, your governor, your U.S. senators, your U.S. congressmen, et cetera, et cetera, they're all like they're the top vote getters. So they had to choose 26 people. And all of the, like I say, the governor and the senators were on the list and, and first and foremost. At the convention, they didn't even make the cut to be the top 26. So North Dakota is sending uh, delegates to the national convention, and they do not include our own governor, our U.S. senators, our U.S. congressmen, uh, the former state party chair, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So what we had at the convention was a, a, a grassroots Effectively, I mean, it was it was a grassroots convention. Years and years and years of being pushed out, pushed away, and ignored and ridiculed. Uh, and finally, now the grassroots have taken control. And so these are real North Dakotans. These aren't the country club Republicans. These are real North Dakotans that care about the values of North Dakota. It tells me that there's a lot of discourse within the mechanics of the party, if nothing else. Yeah, well, that, absolutely. That's that's very true. And it's been that way for a long time. Yeah. So when you're looking at sending these delegates, and, and because that's unique, and we've got a governor that I don't really consider Republican in any way, shape, or form, um, but he's touted as a vice presidential candidate, but is not even going to be a delegate on a national level. How do you not look at that to a certain degree? Yeah, I well, I, I frankly don't know. Governor Burgum is... Because that tells is, me that that individual is not popular in their own state. Right. And he's absolutely not. Certainly not amongst Republicans, maybe more so amongst Democrats. But yeah, he's really... I don't even think he's a Democrat or a Republican. I mean, as far as philosophically, he's just a... a he's glo- a globalist. He's a globalist. I'll, I'll call him what he is. He's yeah. a globalist. He's a globalist, he's technocrat, a elitist. George Soros, Barack Bill Obama, Gates. Bill Gates, globalist. That, yeah. That's what we've got for a governor. Uh, we're talking with Rick Becker, Dr. Rick Becker, candidate for the U.S. House. House. Uh, this is Talk of the Town on Super Talk 1270. <sighs> the comfort of your favorite seat is now your comfy car selling command center, thanks to Carvana. It doesn't get any better than this. Your favorite seat's the best spot in the house. Make it even better by entering your license plate or VIN and getting a real offer in minutes. There really is no place like home. And speaking of home, Carvana will pick up your car from yours after you finalize your offer. Visit Carvana.com or download the app and sell your car from your comfy place. 1270. Welcome back to Talk of the Town on Super Talk 1270. Super Talk 1270, you're tuned to Talk of the Town. I'm Steve Bogner. We're talking with U.S. House of Representatives candidate Dr. Rick Becker uh, running in uh, the primary coming up. Uh, five candidates, actually. Uh, you are not the endorsed Republican. We just talked about that and we'll, kind of the dynamics uh, around that. But uh, as a longtime North Dakota legislator, and you've got a pretty substantial conservative track record to stand on. I do. Why are you running for the House? Uh, give us your elevator pitch. Well, yeah, the, the pitch is that America is in trouble, in big trouble, and the, in large part, if not exclusively, due to elected officials not having a spine. So, you know, maybe my platform could be boiled down to one point, that is have a spine. Now, if we can get some people, there are there are some people in Congress right now that are very, very good. We need to get a few more. And then there'll be enough of them to have a critical mass where they can actually start to force the what, what I call the uniparty into um, uh, recognizing that when you're a Republican, you need to vote like a Republican and vote for the things in the platform of the Republican Party. So 
what we're talking about then is securing the southern border, not passing spending bills until we have funding for securing the border. Uh, We're talking about getting deficit spending under control. Don't spend more than you have. That's very straightforward. America first is something that's in the platform. We need to address the needs we have here in America before we are sending the billions and billions of cash over to other countries. Those are very straightforward uh, things. And then, you know, you've got some of these more, uh, uh, I don't know, nuanced things where we really have to fight against this woke culture uh, that's really taking over every facet of the uh, U.S. government. And really to that end, too, I would say uh, the the executive branch is far too broad, far too powerful, and Congress has let it become that way. And the what I mean primarily there is all of the regulatory agencies fall under the executive branch and they have the power effectively of being a Congress because all of the rules that they put out there have the effect of law and Congress is just letting them do that. Now there's something called a RAINS Act that was passed in the House and, and uh, was introduced in the Senate by Rand Paul. We need to get that through and that what that does is it, it sort of turbocharges the Congressional Review Act where Congress can go in and say, hey, wait a minute, these rules we are going to nullify or we're going we're gonna to take them out if, what, from any agency. And so one of the things I'm looking at is the EPA is putting in all sorts of rule, rules that are killing coal. And those need to be taken out. We need to, you know, cut the EPA off at the knees and and say, nope, we're not putting these rules into place. The ones that are already in place, we're going to uh, eliminate uh, and have Congress really take charge. They've abrogated, they've given away their responsibility of being the ones that are supposed to make law. They've given it over to the unelected bureaucrats and the regulatory agencies. So when you're looking at the regulatory agencies and, and how they've grown under the White House leadership, and who's in power at the White House at the time, because that changes from time to time. And Congress has always had the power of the purse strings, but have not utilized Mm -hmm. that to cut off some of these agencies, because you're looking at more and more power being given. And I see it right here in North Dakota. We're seeing it in Washington, D.C. on a much grander scale, the bureaucracy. You know, I I say here in North Dakota, people made a mistake when they term limited elected officials. They should have term limited the bureaucrats. That's where the problem lies. Right. What what do you say on that and how do you try to fix that in Washington, D.C.? Well, that's see, I think there's a very this is a very important point you're bringing up because this is one of the responsibilities, in my view, of Congress. The, The real power of Congress is the power of the purse. And and what we mean by that is that Congress can choose to or choose not to fund any agency uh, to whatever degree they like. And so when you have these agencies coming up, the bureaucrats coming Most up. Most recently, we just saw that about the IRS and adding way too many more IRS agents. Right. And that's where that fight came in. Congress stepped in and said, mm, we're not funding that. Yes, exactly. And and so you can you can really tailor things if you're going to, again – be principled, have a spine, and fight for them. You can tailor what the what the uh, these regulatory agencies are doing with how much funding you're giving. Not only that, they really we should be using the power of the purse as a as a hammer when you have these bureaucrats coming in and lying to Congress, perjuring themselves, completely running roughshod over Congress. That should not be allowed. You've got. Uh, I mean, this. Well, let's go back to COVID and the CDC and Anthony Fauci. I mean, Congress had the power to say we're going to withhold funding the CDC until you get your house in order, and this nonsense stops. You know, we we that we could have done that. We should have done that. So, how do you make those changes uh, if you're elected to go to Washington D.C. and stand up for North Dakota? How do you help affect that change? Well, you're, you're exactly, you bring up a great point. So I would be one of 435 people. Now, uh, of course, that you split that in half roughly because you need to get a, a, the majority party to be able to do things. Now, there are a good group of people over there in the House Freedom Caucus and a few others as well. So by working with those folks, we can actually accomplish this because you get 
enough people that you're not going to be able to the, the leadership must take these things into consideration because they won't get them passed otherwise you need a good speaker you know mike johnson uh, apparently is okay with use with with having a minority of republicans band together with the democrats to pass legislation you know that's very very concerning well and i throw those in the rhino category because oh, yeah. that's the one thing i was going to ask you too is you see some dissension among the ranks in the republican party but you don't see that on the Democratic side. How do you – because you got to fix sure. that. Well, here I, – I don't know, Steve, because when the, when the Democrats block like you know a, a, a single – when they vote like a single block and show no sense of being able to, to use their brains themselves individually, they, you know, that's concerning. I don't know that we want a Republican Party like that. But, but yes, if we could get the moderate rhinos to actually – act like republicans that would be good and it would be great to have a a, a full majority uh, of people like that but i but these folks like say in the house freedom caucus you know these are the folks they've endorsed me so when people say how are you going to get out you're not going to be able to work with people because you know you're you're you don't compromise enough well these folks endorsed me you know i've got i think 13 house freedom caucus members already and, and plus thomas massey and senator Rand paul and vivek ramaswamy these people have endorsed me for a reason. They recognize when I get to Congress, they want to work with me to get these types of things passed. All right, last couple seconds. Uh, just your pitch for the voters in North Dakota coming up on the primary. Uh, what do you have to say to people to ask you for their vote? Well, we have a, a big choice, a slate of five candidates on the Republican side. And the thing is, we all tend to sound relatively the same. Republicans are all the most conservative people you have ever heard of when you listen to them on the campaign trail. I am the only candidate with a track record, a uh, clear track record, 10 years in the state legislature of being a solid, principled, consistent conservative. And I stand by that. There is nothing like that kind of track record to show what you will do when you get to Congress. We need people in Congress who will be fighters, who aren't afraid to stand up. Even when the times are tough, even when the road is rough, we have to be able to do that. I believe that I am the only candidate who will do that. And if anything, people who have been following politics know that that is true. You bring up one little point I, I want to raise to you. We sent a lot of good people to Washington, D.C., and Washington, D.C. changes a lot of good people. How do you fight against that? Well, I, I, you know, it, it changes some good people. There's a lot of people that sound good, but they were never tested. So did it change them? Who knows? Because they, they, we don't know. We, we, they talk the talk, but apparently they don't walk the walk. Now it does change some people. I don't know. I, I guess if, if there are some people that crave leadership positions or prestige or power, it's hard to, it's hard to weed those folks out, right? People have asked me, how do we know you're not going to? And I say, well, all I can say is look at my last 10 years, talk to me, figure out what my motivation is, um, and then the p- p- proof is going to be in the pudding. And talk to me four years after I'm there, and I will have shown you that I will not cave to that kind of power. Just look at the track record. Uh, if people want more information about your campaign, how do they get a hold of you? Go to rickbecker2024.com. Rick Becker, Dr. Rick Becker, candidate for the U.S. House. This is Talk of the Town on Super Talk 1270. Glenn Beck. Will we work together for equal justice? One where Hunter Biden could get a fair trial in the reddest of states. And Trump could get a fair trial in the bluest of states. Until we restore truth and equal justice, any honest person who votes differently than I do has got to admit the Justice Department has been perverted. Equal justice no longer exists. The Glenn Beck Program. The Glenn Beck Program. Weekdays from 11 till 2 on Super Talk 1270. Talk of the Town. Weekday mornings starting at 9 on Super Talk 1270 and the free Super Talk 1270 mobile app.
KXXX Mandan Bismarck, a Town Square media station, broadcasting from the View Community Credit Union Studio. Man, that sunset is gorgeous. Grill, patio, sunset, hard to get better than that. Unless you're browsing Carvana's inventory while you soak it all in. Oh, burger time. So sit back, get comfortable. Carvana's got thousands of cars under $20,000 just waiting for you. I could stay here forever. Carvana, where car buying meets comfort meets convenience. Download the app or visit Carvana.com today.